Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is the first lecture of Module 8. And in Module 8 we're going to be do, doing genetic analysis and we need to start with Mendel. I want, I'm going to, in this module, I'm going to describe how Mendel's experiments were very careful scientific experiments. He wasn't just a humble friar bumbling around in his garden. And how this work found many things that nobody had ever realized before, that this work was truly revolutionary in its findings. So Mendel's often depicted as, you know, a humble friar. He grew peas. Isn't that charming? But in fact, he was a serious and very well-trained scientist. He studied at the University of Vienna. He studied physics. And he'd read all the latest papers, um, botanical papers, evolutionary papers. He'd read Darwin. He knew that it was important to study the variation in the population, not just to pick out particular individuals and study them. This was really a revolutionary approach. Nobody was paying attention to population level variation. He tested his study system very carefully. He didn't just say, oh, we're growing peas, that's nice, I'll study peas. He spent years purchasing as many different varieties of peas as he could and testing them very carefully for um, phenotyp what we now call phenotypic properties that were stable, that were consistently shown by the variety of peas, and that were clearly distinguishable from the appearances of other kinds of peas. Peas were an excellent choice because they were agriculturally a very important crop, and there were lots of well-bred varieties of peas that he could study. He'd studied statistics. He knew that he couldn't just do small experiments and get small numbers because the chance effects would confound his results. And so he did his experiments over and over and over so he could get sample sizes in the hundreds and thousands. So he had numbers that he could trust. He did another revolutionary thing. He had lots of questions. Everyone had lots of questions about how heredity worked. But he only studied one variable at a time. And by doing this, he was able to keep his results simple enough that he could interpret them carefully and draw solid conclusions. If you study many variables at once, you'll never figure out what's going on. And he was cautious in what he claimed that his results showed. He didn't say they applied to everything, to, even to all plants. He said that these were the conclusions that must be true to explain what he saw in peas. And these factors, the way that he did his science, is entirely responsible for the high quality of his results. So he was, from a modern perspective, we would say he was the first to do what we call genetic analysis, which is what you're going to be doing in this module. He used the results of crosses to make inferences about how heredity works and about how phenotypes are determined. Now, what he found out, it's surprising going through what he found out, how revolutionary his results were. He found out that one kind of element, there must be an element, we now call it a gene, that controlled each of the characters he studied. And so in doing this, he created the concepts of genotype and phenotype. Before then, there was kind of, you know, well, there was the properties of the organism and whatever caused them were kind of blurred together in people's minds. He created this distinction. He concluded that pea plants must have two versions of each of these factors. We would say they must have two alleles of each gene. And in doing this, he created the concept of diploidy. We now know that this is true for pretty much all plants and all animals, but until Mendel, nobody knew this. He found that the ovule and the pollen grains of his peas must have only one version of each of his elements. 
one allele of each gene, we'd say, and that these are randomly chosen from the versions that are present in the parent organism. So he concluded that gametes are haploid, again, a completely new concept. He found that these elements, the genes, and the different versions of them didn't change as they were passed through the generations. In particular, they weren't influenced by the environment of the organism, so that the kind of inheritance often described as a Lamarckian inheritance was not true. The elements were stable. Not only that, they weren't influenced by the presence of different versions of the element in the cell. When, when a plant has two different alleles of a gene, the alleles don't change each other. Instead, they're passed on into the gametes, each unchanged. This was really quite unexpected. It seemed so reasonable that whatever it was that determined phenotype would be influenced by the environment around it, because we see environmental effects on phenotype all the time. But we now know that there are also fundamental genetic effects, and those are not changed. He found that each seed in each organism resulted from one ovum, or one egg, we now know, being fertilized with one pollen grain. This was new. Many people had thought that it was likely that the ovule needed resources from many pollen grains, or the egg needed resources from many sperm before it could develop. He showed you only needed one. He showed also that the two parents, each contributing one cell to the process, contributed equally to the phenotypic character. It wasn't the case that the father's contribution was dominant or that the mother's contribution was dominant, dominant like most important. Both parents contributed equally. And that the effect of an element, an allele, didn't matter whether you inherited it from the ovule or the pollen. We now know that you get one allele from your mother and one allele from your father, but their consequences generally do not depend on which parent that you inherited from. We'll talk about one exception to this in module 11. So his results revealed the full haplodiploid sexual cycle. And finally, he realized that when a plant has two different versions of each of two different genes, two different elements, these elements move independently into the gametes so that what one pair of alleles was doing didn't influence what the other pair of alleles was doing. Now, he discovered this in part because his, um, the genes that he was studying were almost always on different chromosomes. And this, this showed that the mechanisms of inheritance creates new combinations of the alleles of different genes. Again, this was a revolutionary result. Nobody knew this, and this was very important for our understanding of why sexual reproduction exists. So we can list all of these things that Mendel found out together, and it's basically just about all the fundamental principles of inheritance Mendel found out from his work on peace. He concluded this because he, his experiment said these must be the properties of the mechanism of inheritance. This is the only way he could explain his observations. And so this was very much solid scientific genetic analysis. Now, we talked about how Mendel was such a great scientist, and his work had such revolutionary implications. So it's really sad that it had very little impact. He published his work in a scientific journal. He even sent a copy of his publication to various scientists, including Darwin, who we know had it in his collection, but had never read it. Um, he 
did everything except know the right people. So, although his work, his conclusions should have been revolutionary, they weren't because nobody working in the field, nobody really seriously interested in inheritance, read his paper for nearly 50 years. And then his work was rediscovered just at the time that other scientists had advanced to the point that Mendel had been at so many years ago. Coming up next, we're going to take Mendel's findings and connect them to the mechanisms that we already know about. Everything that we've learned about how genes work and how genes are inherited explains the findings that Mendel found, what are often called Mendel's laws. And we're going to tie these together in Lecture 8b. I hope to see you there.